Did you notice him grabbing for the microphone? That was great. That was great. All right, would you please open up your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. We spent the last four weeks making our way through Hebrews chapter 11, And now we come to Hebrews chapter 12, and it's been said, and rightfully so, that you could kind of talk about the themes of Hebrews chapters 11, 12, and 13 among those great three virtues, faith, hope, and love. Hebrews 11 really focuses on faith. We're going to see a lot of hope in Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to see a lot of love expressed in Hebrews chapter 13. But what we want to concern ourselves with now is this transition from chapter 11 where we had this um, museum of the great heroes of the faith presented to us and now coming into chapter 12 where he takes it and very clearly applies their lessons of faith to our life right now. So let's take a look at verses 12, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to read the text in its entirety right now. And I I don't mean this to be a big stand-up, sit-down aerobic kind of thing this morning, but if you would, would you stand and give reverence to the word of the Lord as I read this morning's text. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning now at verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for that joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Father, we have the great opportunity, the great task set before us now to consider Jesus. And I pray that you would help us to do so and that you would help us to have our focus and our mind set upon him. And that as we do that, I pray, Jesus, that you would draw very close to your people and to those who are yet to give their lives unto you that you would speak to them by the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would do that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Did you notice the first verse of those few four verses that we're going to consider this morning? Let me read it to you again. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning now at verse 1. He says, Therefore we also... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Friends, there's a lot in that one verse. You see how it begins connecting with what went before. The first word of the verse is therefore. And therefore, of course, is a connecting word. It connects what he already said in chapter 11 onto what goes on now into chapter 12. Therefore, considering that we have this great uh, collection of the heroes of faith, and that's what he described for us in chapter 11. He described these great heroes of faith going all the way back to Abel, the son of Adam and Eve, and talking about Enoch, and Noah, and Abraham, and Sarah, and Jacob, and Isaac, and Joseph, and the parents of Moses, and Moses himself. And then on into later history, he described 18 individuals by name, and then some other people sort of mentioned collectively. And he walked us through this museum of the great men and women of God who have gone before as an attempt to stir us up. And this is exactly what he's trying to do. Look at what it says right there in verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, because he's drawing on what connected before in chapter 11, we can say that he has in his mind, at least in part, this idea of those who have gone before us in the faith surround us like a great cloud of witnesses. The idea is almost of a stadium, is it not? Really, that's quite the picture that he's drawing. 
surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and we are down there on the playing field. You're playing the game. You're in the action. You're running the race. You're in the competition, and you're surrounded by these great men and women of the faith who have gone on before. You could say, and I don't think, that you're surrounded right there. Noah is surrounding you. Enoch is surrounding you. And not just the Old Testament characters that were mentioned in chapter 11, but you see, he mentions a very large group. That's with the phrase in there, did you notice it in verse one? So great a cloud of witnesses. The idea behind a cloud is a massive group, and if you say so great a cloud, you're talking about a, a massive, massive group. It's a big group. So not just the 18 individuals specifically mentioned, no, it goes much beyond that. You're talking about people from the New Testament. Is it too much to say that part of this cloud of witnesses that surprises us, it's Peter, James, and John, that, that, that it's the other great men and women of the Old Testament and the New Testament as well, and then since then as well, why, why should it stop with the closing of the canon of the New Testament? Wouldn't it be great men and women who have succeeded them in the walk of faith afterwards? It'd be men like, uh, you know, Irenaeus and Athanasius and Martin Luther and Charles Spurgeon and all the rest of them throughout history, they're looking on. Now, I just sort of gave it away when I said they're looking on. It doesn't exactly say that they're looking, does it? It says they surround us, and that implies that they're looking, especially because he's drawing on a stadium metaphor, but we have to say it doesn't exactly say that they're looking, but it seems to imply it. But this brings up sort of a theological question. You know, if you notice, we invited you to text in your questions, and this is one of those Sundays where we're gonna answer the questions right up here on the platform, not in the video studio, but immediately afterwards, just talk about them here on the platform. And I can save you a question right now. Are people really looking at us in heaven? And I can give you a catechal answer, I don't really know. <laughs> this text seems to imply it. We have to admit it doesn't exactly say see, it says surround. But the implication is of seeing. But then people come back with a very good answer to that. They say, listen, how could heaven be heaven? How could heaven be heaven for Charles Spurgeon if he could see me preaching right now? Would that not frustrate him? How could heaven be heaven for anybody else? Maybe our dear relatives or something who have gone on before, if they see us struggle or have difficulty with things, how could it be heaven? And I, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe they can see, but all the questions are answered and it's just not difficult for them the way we think it would be difficult for us. Maybe they can, I don't exactly know, but this is what I do know. I can be very confident about this, are you ready? Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, I can't tell you exactly if they see or how they see or to what extent they see, but we are surrounded by them and God wants the knowledge of them surrounding us to spur us on, to encourage us to run this race. I believe it doesn't stop with even human beings. I believe the Bible tells us very clearly, for example, in Ephesians chapter three, verses 10 and 11, that we are under angelic observation as well, that they look down upon us. This great cloud of witnesses that surround us, it's those who have been known to history and the unnamed great men and women of the faith throughout history. These are people who surround us and perhaps, probably, I don't know exactly how you wanna phrase it, look down upon us, but whether or not they do, we're supposed to take it deep in our heart that this encourages us to run the race and look at it there in verse one, to lay aside every weight and the sin. Notice he speaks of two things. He speaks of sin, which we'll talk about in a moment, but he also speaks of every weight. Have you considered that there may be things that weigh you down in the Christian life that God calls you to live, this race that he expects you to run? There may be things that weigh you down that are not necessarily sin, but they are an impediment. They're a hindrance for you, and God would tell you now, lay them aside. Now, I know this is the part of the message where the preacher sort of goes through a laundry list of things that you're supposed to just, and, and, and hope that it hits one of you. You know, I, I'm not gonna do that. But this is what I am gonna do. I'm gonna pray that the Holy Spirit of God 
God the Holy Spirit, because I believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that that aspect of God that we know of as the Holy Spirit would speak to your heart now and through this message if there is a weight, not a sin, but a weight in your life that needs to be cast off so that you can follow Jesus with greater speed, with greater endurance, with greater effectiveness. It it may be fine for a dozen other people to do, but for you, it's a weight, it's an impediment, and God wants you to lay it aside. I, I could list a bunch of things. Why don't I just let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart? Because this is what I know. You can't run effectively with weights on you. You'd never know it by looking at me, but 25 years ago or so, I ran a marathon, I ran the Los Angeles Marathon, and my goal was to finish without ever walking, without ever stopping, and to finish under four hours. And I'm very happy to say that not only did I fulfill all those goals, I never walked, I never stopped, I finished under 4,000, but I did also finish in the top 1,000 of runners that finished. (laughs) Somewhere in the top 1,000, I can get it exactly. All right, that's not so great, but anyway, I know this. By the way, my sister, my twin sister, just yesterday, she ran a half marathon. And I was all happy for her and everything. Oh, Diane, isn't that great? And then I consider, my sister can outrun me by a far margin right now. And that's kind of that's humbling, isn't it? <laughs> but this is what I do know. You can't run effectively with weight on your back. Go ahead, put 50 pounds in a backpack on your back and go out and run a marathon. It's not going to work, is it? You, you, it's just an impediment. You've got to get it out of the way. And I pray that whatever the Holy Spirit would speak to your heart about what you need to get out of the way, you would do it. Because our choices are not always between right and wrong. But sometimes it's between something that hinders us and something that may not get in the way. So you just got to ask, is there a weight that you need to cast aside? But that's not all that he speaks about in verse 1. Notice it here. He also says, not only the weight, but he says also, verse 1, the sin which so easily ensnares us. The words easily ensnare, this translates a very difficult phrasing in the ancient language. It can be translated actually four different ways. It can be translated easily avoided, or admired, or ensnaring, or dangerous. And instead of picking between the four, aren't all four of those true for us? Isn't it true that there can be sin in our life that is easily avoided, but we don't avoid it, and it's to our ruin. Isn't it true that there can be sin in our life that is admired? It's admired in the world at large, but it hinders us in our life with God. Listen, we have to admit that in every culture, there are sacred cows. In every culture, there are sins that go right along with the status quo, and people don't really mind if you're admired in these sins. I don't know if I'm such an expert observer of our culture today, but I could say it kind of seems to me that if somebody is a proud person, if they're a materialistic person, if they're a selfish or self-centered person, you could get right along pretty well in our culture today. It's not going to be that big of a deal. And so we have to say, even though these sins may in some ways be easily admired or greatly admired, and say, let's put them away. And then you could take it from the thing of ensnaring Aren't some sins more ensnaring than others? I think about it. I think about how often it's true that a sin can be ensnaring because it seems like such a small thing, but then it traps a person and ruins so much in their life. Think about it. Think about the person who you're married but you flirt with other people. I I don't know how you flirt with them. It could be in person, it could be over social media. And honestly, for you, it seems like a harmless diversion. It's just, you're just having fun. It just, it's that. It, It seems like such a small sin, but tell me that that sin of flirtation has not been used to ensnare many people and ruin their life. And then you take the fourth definition, dangerous. Look, some sins are just flat out dangerous, and we need to say, I have nothing to do with this. 
I think about, and this is just one example, I don't want to limit it to this one example at all, but just one that kind of comes to my mind spontaneously, is what a dangerous sin drunkenness and intoxication is. You know why it's so dangerous? Because it's not only dangerous for the sin in itself, but think of all the other sins that it leads to. Think of how many regrettable things people do in a state of drunkenness or intoxication. It's a dangerous sin. Whatever you would say, all of these are ensnaring. And the writer of the Hebrews says, put them away. Look at those great heroes of faith. You're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Don't mess around with this. Instead, verse one, let us run this race with endurance. That's what you need and I need. Endurance to finish what we've begun in Jesus Christ. He's set a race before us. You could say that he's right there. Jesus is there at the starting point and he's there at the finish line. And he says, let's go run. He set before each one of us a race. And you have to run it. That race is gonna involve effort and commitment. You don't run a race casually. You gotta be in and hopefully all in. And that's how Jesus Christ asks us to run this race. So he says, look at your life, your walk with God. Get serious about it. You're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Lay aside the weight. Get rid of those besetting sins and go on with Jesus Christ. Now in all of this, we have an ultimate example. That's why he says in verse two, look at now verse two. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Friends, I love this. Because he gives us this unbelievable image of being surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. He gives us this exciting image of we're running a race. There's others running the race with us because he said, let us run the race. And even though you might say we each have our individual race to run, we're all collectively running. And here we are, we have all these things in mind, but he says, in spite of all that, this is what I want you to do. I want you to look unto Jesus. I like how the New American Standard translate that verse. The New King James Version, which I normally teach from, it uses that phrase, looking unto Jesus. But I just like how it says it in the New American Standard, fixing our eyes on Jesus. It's like you put a lock on him. That's who I'm gonna look at. That's who I'm gonna concentrate as I run this race. I'm gonna look at Jesus. And friends, the idea behind this involves a definite looking away from other things and a definite looking upon Jesus. You ever try to look at two things at the same time? You know, trying to split your vision or look over something and keep things in mind? No, 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 listen, forget about that. Look away from other things and put your eyes upon Jesus. And so think about, we're surrounded by this cloud of witnesses, but we're not primarily looking at them. We're on a race course to run, but we don't even look primarily at the race course. We might be having weights or, or besetting sins in our past. We don't even look at those. We don't look at the other runners, but we fix our eyes on Jesus. And I think we do this for two important reasons. First of all, we fix our eyes on Jesus because he gives us the strength and the ability to run. Do you realize how wonderful that is? Jesus says, if you will keep your vision locked in on me, I will impart to you the strength and the vision that you need to run this. You need the endurance? Then get your eyes off yourself. You need the endurance? Get your eyes even off your besetting sins. Lock in like a laser beam upon Jesus Christ and he will give you the strength that you need. So we need the strength, the endurance to do it, but we also need something else. We need to know how to run this race, don't we? Don't we need to know an example, a forerunner, somebody going before us, Friends, that's what Jesus is for us as well. He is not only for us, the one who gives us the ability to run the race, but he is as well our example, showing us how to love, how to speak truth, how to live in this world that God has given us to live. You see, I think it's very important to say this, that we must guard against only seeing Jesus as an example. That's an error that some Christians make. They think that Jesus' great role and great work is to be a moral example for humanity. But friends, I want you to consider very carefully. 
We are not rescued from our sin, our shame, our own destruction. We're not rescued from any of that by the moral example of Jesus. We're rescued by what he did for us on the cross. That he died and he stood as a substitute in our place. And all the sin and the shame and, and the guilt that my sin deserved, it was put upon him and I am rescued by his substitutionary sacrifice. So I understand that. Yet nevertheless, we still look to Jesus as an example. Oh no, not only an example, but he is still our example. He is, notice verse two uses this phrase, the author and finisher of our faith. He's not just the author, he's also the finisher. He's not just there at the starting line, he's there at the finish line, and if I could be so bold to say it, he's there every step in between. I love how Paul expressed it in another place in the New Testament, in Philippians chapter one, verse six, where he says this, He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. You you should have a group or a set of passages of scripture memorized in your mind. This is a good one to memorize. How encouraging is that? It's encouraging for you. It's encouraging for those that you love. It's encouraging to pray this verse for yourself and for others. No, Lord, I know that he who has begun a good work in me will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. You're not just the beginner of the work of my life, but also you're the one who finishes it. You're the author and the finisher, and he did it all. Look at it here in verse two. Who for the joy that was set before him, When Jesus went to the cross, he did not regard the cross in itself as a joy. No, he regarded the cross with some measure of horror. Do you remember the battle that Jesus went through in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before his crucifixion? Where he pled with the Father and he said, Father, if there is any other way to accomplish this rescue of humanity than let this cup pass from me. But there was no other way. And so Jesus embraced it, but he didn't necessarily go to the cross with joy in and of the cross, but as he looked beyond the cross and saw the good that it would accomplish, he could endure it with joy. Do you know what the joy of the cross was for Jesus? the joy that laid beyond the cross, what he would accomplish by the cross. I don't mean to sound overly sentimental or you know, maudlin, if that's the right word for it. But I tell you, the joy that was set before Jesus was you. And I mean that. You, his people, his redeemed. I, again, I don't mean to sound too sentimental about it, but I, I think it's fair to say he could see your face. He could see you, his child, his redeemed one, the one who would receive that great sacrifice that he would pour out on the cross. And he said, for them, to bring them to me, to give them life both now and eternity, to transform them, to spend eternity together with them, this makes it worth it for me to undergo the ordeal of the cross, and so therefore I will embrace it. I will, look at the phrase it used there in verse two, he endured the cross. He was able to endure the ordeal of the cross because he understood the good that would come of it. The good of a redeemed, rescued people that would honor God for all of eternity. And I hope that's you. If it's not you, you've waited too long. And just today's the day for you to give up and to simply give your life to Jesus Christ and repent of your sins and put your trust in him. But you see, knowing all the good that would flow from that agonizing experience of the cross, Jesus was able to endure through it. Through the whole ordeal of the cross, he could keep it together. Jesus kept his tongue through the whole ordeal of the cross. He kept his course through the ordeal of the cross. He kept his progress, he kept his joy, he kept his love, and he did it all. Look at it there in verse two. Despising the shame. He didn't rejoice in the shame. Jesus wasn't some kind of sick masochist. He despised the shame, yet he went through the ordeal of the cross. And I just want you to consider for a few moments how shameful the ordeal of the cross was. Do you understand that when the Romans crucified a person, that they deliberately constructed it to be as shameful as possible? 
That's why normally, and I can't say that there were never exceptions to this, but normally, when the Romans crucified somebody, they were absolutely naked. Not a shred of clothing on them. Why? Just to humiliate the person all the more. And this is what they did. That's what the, the, the whole cross was about. It was the imposition of shame upon a person. And listen, we, we live in a culture that not universally, I don't want to exaggerate this, but at definite places and points wants to impose shame upon us for being followers of Jesus Christ. Now, on the one hand, we should bear this with a badge of honor. My Lord went to the cross despising the shame. He didn't even consider it. He didn't value the shame. He despised it. And in the same way, as me, his follower, if people try to impose shame upon me for being a follower of Jesus Christ, I will not regard it. I will despise it. Think about all the hellish shame that Jesus endured to accomplish our salvation. He bore a shameful accusation. They accused him of blasphemy. Can you imagine accusing God himself of blasphemy? He bore a shameful mocking. He bore a shameful beating. He wore a shameful crown. He wore a shameful robe. And he bore a shameful mocking even as he prayed for those who were crucifying him on the cross. Despising the shame, Jesus showed this amazing and profound courage. That's, I think, something that we need more of in the Christian world today. More courage, more backbone. Looking unto Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith, we say, Jesus, you showed such amazing courage. Would you fill me with this courage? Now, I don't mean to apply that courage is universally absent. No, I'm sure that you are quite courageous in some areas of your life. I just want to know, are you courageous when it comes to being a follower of Jesus Christ? I read something this week in a sermon by Charles Spurgeon, that great preacher of Victorian England. He talked about how this lack of courage, this lack of ability to despise the shame, how it's a stumbling block to many people, how many people will do just about anything for Jesus except endure shame or embarrassment on his behalf. Spurgeon spoke very boldly to Christians who had a difficulty with this. And I'll just read you what he said, it's quite bold. Here we go. Spurgeon said this, yet you are a coward. Yes, put it down in English. You are a coward. If anyone called you so, you would turn red in the face. And perhaps you're not a coward in reference to any other subject. But what a shameful thing it is that while you are bold about everything else, you are cowardly about Jesus Christ. Brave for the world, but cowardly towards Christ. We don't want to be in that place. We want to look to Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith. We need to see how he's rewarded. Look at the end phrase of verse 2. And has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This speaks of Jesus' glorification and the same promise. If we will endure the shame with him, we will be glorified with him. Now, friends, I am so grateful that we live in a society, that we live in a culture where we are not out and out persecuted as it is true in other places in the world. And I am also glad that the culture is not universally against us as we try to live our Christian life. But the places where it is and the places where we would be mocked or attempted to be made ashamed, we need to show greater and greater courage in the face of all of that. As he goes on, look at here in verses three and four, he says this. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Again, he's drawing our vision back to Jesus one more time, where he says in verse three, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. You see, even in their difficulty, if they would consider Jesus, they would be encouraged. Not discouraged, but encouraged. They would know that they're following in the footsteps of Jesus. 
And friends, can I tell you, that is just a very good place to be. Even if the world doesn't approve of it at this point or that, to know that you are following in the footsteps of Jesus, there's no better or more blessed or safer place to be. Even though it is true, Jesus faced a lot of hostility from sinners. Think of it. At his own congregation in Nazareth, when he went to go preach there, what happened? By the end of the sermon, they wanted to kill him, literally. Uh, the, the, The religious leaders were constantly trying to trap Jesus, to embarrass him. They lied about Jesus. They said that he was a drunkard and a glutton. He was betrayed by one of his own disciples. He was mocked and he was beaten. And even his own people, as he stood before the Roman governor, they cried out to him saying, crucify him, crucify him. Friends, that's facing a lot of hostility from other people. Nevertheless, Jesus bore it and we should consider him in whatever hostility we must endure as the followers of Jesus. You will have to endure certain things as a follower of Jesus. You face particular stresses in your life. But because being a follower of Jesus, you wanna do things the right way. You don't wanna cheat. You don't wanna cut corners. You wanna do things with honesty and integrity. And sometimes that puts enormous pressure upon a person. You feel family responsibilities because you're a follower of Jesus. And you feel like there's something you need to give to your family that maybe other people don't care about giving, but you care about it because you're a follower of Jesus. And that brings unique pressure, unique hardship on your life. Because you're a follower of Jesus, sometimes you're gonna face rejection, sometimes misunderstanding, sometimes injustice, sometimes scorn and mocking and being the butt of jokes. Occasionally you're gonna face outright hatred and hostility and all of that will come upon you as a great stress, as a great pressure. And you see Jesus in the midst of all of that, he's looking to you and he says, look at me. Look at me, my child. You are following in my footsteps. I think about what we have to endure sometimes as followers of Jesus, and and it is not insignificant. And I know the price that some of you pay for being committed in following after Jesus Christ, but then I think of the price that some have to pay in other countries, in other places in this world, how they face great deprivation, great persecution, sometimes torture and murder for the sake of Jesus Christ. And then I think, Jesus, you can strengthen us all to meet this challenge. In all of that, if we would, and I'm reading from the verse again here, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. It brings two things to us, two things that we vitally need. The first thing that it brings us is perspective. In light of what Jesus suffered, what do our sufferings compare? Now, I don't mean to say that that your sufferings are insignificant, no. They are significant. They're significant because, well, they're significant for you. They're your sufferings. You know, it's like that way in the medical field. Everybody else has a minor surgery, but for you, man, if they're gonna open you up, they're gonna open you up, and this is a big deal. And so I don't wanna say your trials are unimportant or insignificant. They're your trials, and God bless you, and he cares for you in them, yet, in the big picture, compare them to what Jesus endured. We go, okay, Lord, that gives me perspective, but we don't need only perspective. You know what else we need? We need comfort. We need to recognize that a sympathetic Jesus is right beside us, speaking to us, telling us, my child, I love you. I'm here with you in the midst of this. Look to me and receive strength. Look to me and receive power to undergo this, and I am with you every step of this difficult journey. The price for not doing this, look at it here in verse three. Lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You see, when we know that Jesus doesn't ask any more from us than he has himself experienced, when we know that he has gone through worse than what we even have and he stands right beside us as a sympathetic savior, it helps us to not become weary and discouraged in our souls. Maybe that's where I want to end it right now today. 
it would not surprise me if there's not more than a few souls among us. Frankly, you are weary and discouraged. You've come here from the midst of a lot of pressure this past week, and you look forward to the next week, and you know there's even more pressure waiting for me next week. And you're hoping that God would give you something right here, right now, to help you make it through another week, glorifying Jesus to the best of your uh, life's ability. Well, here's what he says to you. Don't be weary. Don't be discouraged. I have both gone before you and I am right beside you. Look to me. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And he, he changes the focus of everything. Father, this is my prayer for your people. It's my prayer for myself, Lord. Lord, all through this, we need to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And I pray, Lord, I pray in particular those who face the difficulty of a weight that drags them down, who face the difficulty of sin that so easily ensnares them. And I pray that by your grace, by your power, you would help them to set those things aside and run with endurance the race that you've set before them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this message of hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.